So, true story, I couldn't sleep one night and I thought I would try and do just a little bit of maths to, to send myself to sleep. I thought, do you know what? Hold my hot chocolate, I'm going in, I'm gonna try the magic square of squares. Which famously, Matt had a go at, the Parker Square, and also failed at. <laughs> I don't want to call it the Parker Square. Someone would do something that's almost right, but not quite, and they go, that's a real Parker Square kind of move. And I have also failed at, but I found something really cool, I, I think, anyway. Um, I call them anti-Parker Squares because only the diagonals work. <laughs> It feels a bit mean. It feels a bit mean calling them anti-Parker squares. I just want to say, I'm not looking to start any beef with Matt. And actually, in Matt's new book, there is a line which says, my friend, Alien McDonald. So that's, that's printed. You can't take that back as I write anti-Parker. <laughs> so I thought, if we are to be able to find a magic square where all of the numbers are themselves square, and Matt got real close apart from the diagonals, the diagonals are going to have to work and that seems to be the weak point. So I thought I'll come in from the diagonals, I'll make sure my diagonals work first and then everything else will just like fall into place. Not so much. <laughs> Classically in a magic square you need all of the rows, columns and diagonals to add to the same thing and there will be some sort of number in the centre. I'm just going to call it x for now. Whatever number is here should have some sort of difference from x. We're, we're trying to make sure there's no duplicates in these magic squares. So I'm going to call that x minus a because there will be a difference. I don't know what the difference is, but it exists. You can go through and prove yourself. It's a fun little exercise, takes five minutes. I do recommend that whatever the number is in the center of the magic square, the magic constant will be three times that. So on this magic square, algebraically, I, the magic constant would be 3x. Okay, and so you might notice that going down this diagonal, because we have a difference here of minus a, that means we have to have a kind of reciprocal balance. We've got to have x plus a up here. So this is how the diagonals are going to work. And I want all of these numbers to be square. So I want x to be square, I want x minus a to be square, and I want x plus a also to be square. And I start thinking about, you know, what does that actually mean? In my mind, I think about things geometrically. And so this means I am looking for three numbers, all of which are square, but which sit equidistant on the number line. You don't have to look very far for this one. You, you can find this quite easily. So one squared would be one. Five squared is 25, and seven squared is 49. I was surprised, I was, I was getting somewhere real quick. I thought this is going well. So the difference here is 24, the difference here is 24. I found this set of three equidistant squares. Unfortunately, on a magic square, you do have another diagonal. Other people have noticed this. And like I say, we want all of the numbers to be different. So I'm gonna call this one x minus b. Whatever it is, I want it to be different from b in some sort of way. They're all gonna add up to three x. So that means to balance it out, a little seesaw action over here, this is gonna be x plus b. Okay, so now what this has created is a number x in the middle, which then needs to be equidistant from x minus a and x plus a. And all of these are square and it needs to be doubly equidistant. I need another set uh, so that x minus b and x plus b are also equidistant squares. So I need to find a number which <laughs> has this doubly equidistant square property. I turned to a spreadsheet. I was like, it's spreadsheet time, let's go. And I, again, I did not have to look very, very far to get my first one. So if we have 25 squared as our central square, this is doubly equidistant from 17 squared, 31 squared, 5 squared, and 35 squared. And when I saw this on my admittedly disgusting spreadsheet, I was like, oh, we've done it. The Parker square is born. Well, the anti-Parker square. Because now I can put 25 squared in the middle. Then I can do 17 squared. 5 squared, 17 is equidistant from 31, and this is equidistant from 35. All square numbers and the diagonals work. Unfortunately, only the diagonals work. <laughs>
So you might have noticed there's like a bit of a link going on here because the first one I found that was singly equidistant was 5 squared. The second one, which is doubly equidistant, is 25 squared. So I continued adding lines to my spreadsheet manually, might I add, because I am bad at code. And the next doubly equidistant number, which I found, was 50. So 50 squared sits in between 34 squared and 62 squared, they're equidistant, and 10 squared and 70 squared. So I was like, okay, very much like buses or monotiles, now that I've found one of these anti-Parker squares, I think I have a way of generating infinitely many of them. Um, and I do. So 50 works, 75 works, 100 works, all of the multiples of 25 work. Um, and bear in mind, all of them are squared. So when I say 25, I mean 25 squared, so big numbers. So then I was like, ooh, here's my, my next anti-Parker square. So then at this point I have to think, is there something special about the number 25 or the number 5? What's happening here? Because it seems to have generated this 25 squared seems to have generated an infinite family of these uh, doubly equidistant. Because, I mean, 25 squared is 5 to the power of 4. By the time you get to 5 to the power of 6, then you start getting triply equidistant, 5 to the power of 8. Um, that's quadruple, and, and it goes on so, for, so on and so forth. Um, which is cool, because that means you start having options for which ones you put in your corners. And this is how these sort of puzzles get you, because you really, like, you feel like you're getting somewhere. Um, but every time you, you pull on that thread, um, I don't know, you just get more and more questions. And then I ran into the number 169. Let's get a new piece of paper. So at this point, I've found that 5 squared produces doubly equidistant squares. I've got 13 squared producing doubly equidistant squares. And the sun is coming up and I, <laughs> I'm feeling happy about maths and I've started a tab in my terrible spreadsheet just titled yay. So the next one after 5 and 13 would be 17, then 29, 37, 41. And at this point, I'm like, okay, I have a decent list of numbers here. Let's go to the OEIS. So that's the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. I want to know, is there something special that connects these numbers? I can see that they're all prime, but it's not all of the primes. You know, I'm, I'm missing 7, 11, like, this is a subset of the primes. What are they? So I type into the OEIS 5, 13, 17, 29, 37, and they are the Pythagorean primes. Pythagorean primes are prime numbers in the form 4n plus 1. So you can see you've got the number 4 plus 1 would get you 5. 12 is in the 4 times table, plus 1 gets you 13. This is 1 more than 16. So they are prime numbers which like, like the formula says, they're one more than um, a multiple of four. There is another way of thinking of them as well, which, you know, because you're thinking Pythagorean, this has got to have something to do with triangles. I came here for squares and squares in squares. Sorry, <laughs> it's triangle time. So if you have any Pythagorean prime, so like the very first one, five, and you do like root five, this will form the hypotenuse of a triangle which has integer legs, like the smaller lengths. So uh, this would be sides one and two. Uh, one squared is one, two squared is four, one plus four is five, and so the length of this hypotenuse is root five. There is also um, a relation that you can do um, that kind of you can take the Pythagorean primes as they are, and they will be the hypotenuse of um, Pythagorean triples. So, second best triangle in the world, three, four, five, right angle triangle. This is our very first Pythagorean prime. So, any of these would equally be the definition of a Pythagorean prime. And, I don't know, I was just so happy that I started with something absolutely impossible. Um, and I definitely have not figured it out, but I found something cool along the way. The real friends were the maths we made along the way. Um, so at that point I was feeling kind of satisfied. Um, I've found an infinite number of anti-Parker squares where only the diagonals work, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> So there was a solid point where I actually did think that maybe I was onto cracking this because 
As with all interesting open problems in maths, it's not just that we want to find a magic square where all of the numbers themselves are square. We would be just as happy if we could show that it definitely does not exist, if it's impossible. So that's, that's the challenge. And when you look at the in-between sections here on our kind of algebraic magic square, because this row also needs to add to 3x, we already have two x's, we give it another x in here, we need to subtract both a and b. So this would be minus a minus b. And on my spreadsheet, this number here was persistently negative. And so I was kind of like, right, if I can show that this is always going to be negative, then that's it. Like, it's never going to work. And then randomly, I have no idea why this happened, but at 3,125 squared in the centre, a positive one appeared, an all positive um, anti-Parker square. Would you like to see it? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so we've got 3,125 squared. So this is part of the 25 squared family. And I believe that this has happened because at this point, you now have, it's not doubly or quint or whatever equidistant, it's got quite a lot of different options. So you have, you're only picking four for the corners out of many, many more options. And just some of them are close together enough that it does become positive. So here's our anti-Parker framework, the diagonals, they do work. After this, it's not going to work, but it is going to be positive at least. <laughs> so up here, um, this works out to be x plus a plus b. So this is usually a very, very large number. Okay, and then this is the number, this is the place, the x minus a, x minus b, where I really thought that all of them were going to fall down by virtue of being negative. And this one comes out as 3038641, which unfortunately is not square, but it is positive. And there are quite a few in the, the 3125 squared family, which are all positive. So that ruined my chances of disproving, um, of saying that there's, there's some sort of reason that means there can never be uh, a magic square made of squares. <sighs> okay, so this bit, I am hesitant to say because it's bordering on conspiracy theory in terms of maths. Um, this could be entirely wrong. It's a very, very strong hunch that I have. I just want to have it recorded in case I turn out to be right later on. I think, although I cannot prove that this problem, the magic square made of squares problem, is the same as the perfect Euler brick problem. So I'll explain what the perfect Euler brick problem is. Okay, so the Euler brick is where you have a cuboid and all of the lengths are integers, but also all of the face diagonals are integers as well. And to find a perfect Euler brick, we also want the spatial diagonal, which runs from the bottom front up to that back top corner there. So it goes in between through the cube up there. We want that to be an integer too. And nobody has ever found one. Nobody has ever proved that you can't find one. So it's still in that similar gray zone um, as the magic square of squares. And after looking at the diagonals and kind of realizing that the Pythagorean primes generate diagonals which would work if the magic square of squares could work, um, now we have right angles in the mix, like it's getting a bit triangly um, because we have these Pythagorean primes. And although we have never been able to find one of these, through the powers of modular arithmetic, there are some things which we know about it. So if this perfect Euler brick does exist, then either one edge, face or space diagonal must be divisible by either 17, 29 or 37 and come oh, on they're right here 17 29 37 and i just think it's like on the tip of my mathematical brain that i feel like there must be a link between them but um i would never obviously say this on record because i cannot yet prove it um but even if i did it would be a pointless exercise because both of these problems are equally unsolved. <laughs> Our channel sponsor Jane Street has amazing internships available in offices around the world, including here 
in one of my favourite cities. Can you guess where it is? It's Hong Kong. Jane Street's a global quantitative trading firm using all the latest innovations in machine learning, distributed systems, programmable hardware and statistics to trade on markets around the world. And if you'd like to get a taste of the action, the Hong Kong office has opportunities available in both winter and summer, depending on what might work best with your university schedule. Oh, and don't worry if you don't live in Hong Kong, Jane Street's going to cover your flights and accommodation. Everything's taken care of. The people there are amazing, the officers are great, and the work, it's just the sort of clever problem-solving type stuff that I think Number File fans might enjoy. What a chance to experience work at the cutting edge in an amazing city. Full details about this opportunity and other stuff going on at Jane Street can be found, as usual, in the video description. The total for this square is 3,051. And it works for all the columns, it works for all the rows. It only works for one of the diagonals. So this diagonal here works. This diagonal here doesn't work. And so it's a semi-magic square. Also, as you may have spotted, some numbers are in there more than once. Has this surface got a name? Uh, I, no. Can I suggest one? What would you like to call it? The Parker surface. <laughs>